here again and welcome to the real world industry analysis for the November 2018 sitting on Grapple. Now this industry is quite interesting, it's the soft drinks industry. I'm sure we've all had some soft drinks in our time, perhaps even a lot of soft drinks in our time. And just to preface this particular product, what we're looking to do here is to analyze the context of the industry. So what we're gonna be looking at is what our actual role is, and we're a finance manager, which is important of course, but also we get told that we are liaising with all the other functional areas, which is really, really important. So as we move forwards here, we're gonna be constantly thinking about the kinds of ideas that the industry has so far, what they're planning in the future, and how that relates to our case. Again, it's quite a lot of speculation because this is the context. This could be just the base material by which SEMA draw upon and give you your exam questions upon. So, let's introduce the industry. So first and foremost, we know, like nobody in the world has not seen Coca-Cola, for example, and the soft drinks industry is dominated by Coca-Cola and Pepsi as two huge companies. Now the history is, you know, it's context that isn't as applicable, but the important part is that as we move through here, we know that the success begins in the 1800s, so it's a long-standing industry, a mature industry, that's really critical, because that determines what kind of strategy companies in the industry are going to undertake. Typically in mature industries, we're looking for consolidation, and consolidation essentially means buying other companies, creating a larger product range, penetrating the existing market. There's not a whole lot of innovation. It's a mature market, it's there to stay, and we're looking to gain a bigger market share by just being bigger and having more successful products. So, as we just briefly go through the history part, that's like, it's interesting, it will help you understand, so I would definitely recommend you read the whole document if you've got the time. But importantly, we're gonna come down to here and see that Coca-Cola, of course, who else, is going to be our success story as we look at the industry. So the story is actually pretty interesting. In the first year of its creation, they managed to sell an astonishing nine glasses. Yeah, <laughs> that's sarcasm. Nine glasses is obviously not a lot. But the company was bought and it was turned into this company where they were aggressively promoted throughout the 1890s, throughout the next whole century, to the point where you can go back to a historical film or documentary and you will literally see Coca-Cola adverts. Now, what does it actually mean for our industry? Well, what it actually means is that branding is ultra important. The, the path has been paved by companies like Coca-Cola and Pepsi, and the branding is so, so critical because you, you're almost selling, there's so many different soft drinks, you're selling the brand almost as much as you're selling the product. You want them to buy into the sort of loyalty aspects of Coca-Cola tastes great, it's better than Pepsi, or it's better than you know my supermarket's Coca-Cola, that's like 40p, so I'm always gonna buy Coca-Cola. You have to push the brand, essentially. So with this in mind, that's the kind of take home point as we move through this section. Again, we're a bit light on highlighting here, we're gonna be far more in depth in the later sections, but for now, we're gonna move on to the industry life cycles. So, this typically, covers the sort of rise, fall, plateauing, and maybe another rise for different drinks companies. So there's the still category and the CSDs, that's carbonated soft drinks, and there is a differentiation. CSDs are dominated by Coca-Cola and PepsiCo. However, there is a lot of research that shows that CSDs are on the decline, and we're gonna see this moving forwards as you can see with this graphic, sorry, and as we move forwards, we're gonna see different regulations and consumer awareness about the bad parts, about consuming so much sugar 
in your soft drinks, that means that CSDs are going down. So the gap is definitely there for non-CSD, so steel products, to flourish. And my understanding from the, uh, the grapple, rather, case study, is that actually they've got quite a lot of steel drinks. And whilst they didn't do too much on the products, if you look at it briefly, we do know that you know they're making quite a lot of their revenue from these steel products, perhaps even the largest chunk. So with that in mind, you know it looks good for Grapple. On the flip side, however, aside from this decline, there is the dominance of the brand, as I mentioned, and there's not a lot of space for new entrants. If you look at the US carbonated soft drink market, you see two Goliaths here, and then a very marked step down. So Dr. Pepper Snapple is, in my opinion, what this company is based from. You know, Snapple, Grapple, the sort of very obvious mirroring is there. But these two Leviathans in the third place, they're just so much ahead of the other companies in carbonated soft drinks. So with that in mind, our placement as Grapple is definitely that of being dwarfed in that, that kind of market, especially by Coca-Cola and Pepsi, and how we sort of bridge the gap to some extent and differentiate via steel drinks is going to be crucial for the case. Now on this page we compare the car manufacturers market to soft drinks, the sort of dominance. And as you can see there is one US Leviathan here, GM Motors, they have a huge market share. But then you can see quite a lot of different companies that are doing pretty well as well. There's not this hegemony that you see in the carbonated soft drinks market. So it's quite crucial to think about that there's gonna be loads of these smaller companies and if it's a mature market where consolidation can help us bridge the gap to Coca-Cola and Pepsi, suddenly acquisitions look quite attractive because other smaller companies will add value to the business, won't be too large to buy. And another trend that we see in the industry is health conscious customers. As I mentioned, CSDs are going declining and this is predominantly because of the sort of focus on the health impacts of these carbonated soft drinks. As you can see, the per capita consumption is trending downwards in the US. And we use the US just because they have a large population. Data is really easy to grab there. But in terms of grapple, we're looking at steel drinks. Not all of it, but steel drinks being a large portion of their revenue. And this bodes well that the Leviathans are going to do less well. And as we saw in the comparison page on the case study, their profit margins are going very, very much down. Even though they do look for small profit margins in mass volume, the actual profit is quite low in terms of increases, whilst Grapple is increasing at a very rapid rate. So that's very beneficial. As we go through here, we can see again lots of like declining sales of brands of soft drink, carbonated that is. So in summary, what we care about is that CSDs are on the downtrend and still drinks are on predominantly the uptrend if we, if we extrapolate the fact that Grapple are growing so marvelously in the past year financially. So that sector is kind of locked off by PepsiCo and Coca-Cola. So a new product or project is predominantly going to come in the steel market, I imagine. So it's quite important for us to note that. Importantly, Grapple may be losing some revenue in terms of the healthy trend, but because they do seem to have a large amount of steel drinks, they are less sensitive to this risk than the likes of Carnival and Party Pops, who we see are basically the Coca-Cola and PepsiCo of Zedland, our fake nation that we're you know, looking at in the case study. So, I won't go through this paragraph again. Please read it through to sort of get a dual understanding but the voiceover, obviously, I've covered a lot already about how CSDs are on the downtrend. Steel drinks are quite important, and maybe Grapple can bridge the gap with some acquisitions because of how the market is placed with two Leviathans and many smaller companies. The juicy stuff. Now, this is the industry examples. Now, there's a lot of them. I'm not going to go through many of them, just two that I want to pick out. But importantly, if you don't have time to read the document, in its entirety, the thing you must do, or you should do at least, is read the industry examples. Try to ingrain them in your memory a little bit. There's 25 of them. 
and essentially they're there to offer you very easy ways to connect case issues into the real world. So blah, blah, blah did this to do this. Given that Grapple were facing a similar issue, they could also follow suit by doing X, Y, Z, that kind of thing. I'm gonna see some examples now. So the first one I wanted to talk about is PepsiCo building one of the largest manufacturing plants in an area of the world that you typically wouldn't have expected. It's about foreign expansion and ensuring that they're making significant investments elsewhere. Currently, Grapple only operate in Zedland. They only have one site, and given their recent financial performance, they really need to counteract that and need to be focusing on this exporting issue if they want to become very, very big. So, how would you weave that in? I won't read this entire paragraph, but for example, in the last two years, both Pepsi and Coca-Cola have established manufacturing plants in the Middle East. It's a growing market. And with this in mind, given that Grapple want to increase their market share in terms of a global sense, and they want to be a leading manufacturer, they could then do a similar activity in a different part of the world, such as the Middle East, and ensure that they are reducing distribution costs and accessing markets that really want their drinks products at the lowest cost possible. That kind of thing. So we know exporting is pretty important. So this kind of issue is probably going to come up in one of the variants. So have a look at that paragraph in its entirety. You sort of think about how you could word that in very different scenarios. You know, it'll be random. The exam's about adapting. You'll get all this, you have all this information in your head. You'll get some unseen material and a question you've never seen before. But ultimately, try to memorize this kind of information so you can adapt your knowledge and your contextual understanding to producing a very nice paragraph that demonstrates you know both the theory and how other companies have done or solved this challenge. Now we skip a few ahead to, yes, you guessed it, the sugar tax. So issue number five is the sugar tax. So ultimately governments around the world have decided that the health concerns around high sugar diets and the contributions of soft drinks to that problem is quite a big issue and that they're looking to tax the industry far higher than they did before because of this sugar content. So some brands such as Iron Brew, very famously in the UK, not very big across the world, but in the UK it's quite a big soft drink. They actually chose to reduce their sugar content to not be hit by this tax. It was very unpopular with consumers because they loved the original taste of the drink. So that might not be an appealing option. And if it isn't, then Grapple have a problem. They should decide who absorbs the cost. You've heard me say that before, but it's so, so important. So the important issue here is sugar tax, AKA regulations. And if Zedlin follows this current trend, it may not be long before these are imposed on Grapple's products. So how do we manage this into an exam paragraph? So as a majority of Grapple sales are domestic, it's imperative that Grapple is aware of any changes in tax that occur. If Zedlin were to adopt the sugar tax as proposed in the exam question, you can then talk about how this tax will be pretty, pretty important in terms of adding extra costs to production and getting it to market. So the supply chain is affected quite drastically. And what you could do is incorporate some E2 negotiation theories to decide that perhaps Grapple should negotiate with retailers to share the cost between them to avoid laying off staff. So in that kind of question, you could bring in not only the regular regulatory aspects, pestle analysis, but also you could bring in negotiation theory regarding sorting a deal with retailers and AKA customers, which then sell to consumers. But also you could then bring in the learning curve because, which is again an E2 theory by the way, you could then bring that in because if the cost is fully absorbed by Grapple, they may need to lose some staff. If they lose some staff to redundancies, then other staff will be a bit more demotiv demotivated, less morale in the business, and then the learning curve goes down, which means production is less efficient. So with that in mind, you can bring in all these issues into a succinct paragraph, as you can see here. This one focuses more, this example rather, focuses more on potential tax changes. So this exam question is likely 
to be something along the lines of, could you draft up a report of possible tax changes or regulatory changes that could affect the business, it's like a risk, a pestle risk question. However, it could be framed in a different way, such as sugar tax is coming, ah, what do we do? So many ways you can approach this, but remember you to weave in every bit of theory that interlinks with this, as mentioned. So that's all for the video side of this product. Again, I do implore you to, at the very least, read through the 25 examples, loads of content for you to absorb. And if you have extra time, read through that entire document and get a really good understanding of the context because if you're really confident on the theory and the case information, the next step is to definitely be super confident on the industry as well. So thank you very much for listening and very much good luck in the exam. I will see you in the pre-scene analysis videos if you haven't already been there. Hello, it's me again. I just wanted to take a few minutes of your time to first extend my hope that you enjoyed the free sample that you've just viewed, but also to just sort of explain what else the strategy do to help you pass your exam really effectively, provided you found our sample particularly interesting and insightful, of course. So, of course, we have a study text for every module ranging from P1 to F3 and the certificate level is also free on our website so we have study texts throughout the SEMA course every module you could hope to study the certificate level are free as I mentioned and then the rest of them ranging from P1 to F3 are all available to purchase alongside this if you're not so much a study text kind of student and you prefer a visual way of learning we have the course videos we essentially break down the study text into bite-sized presentations with a walkthrough and it's, it's a very 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 engaging way of explaining the course following this we have the pre-scene analysis where we break down each pre-scene sitting into a number of videos going through the whole document but also adding a top 10 recommendations for what will come up in the exam and also a strategic analysis where we put all the models you'd find in E2 for example to the pre-scene itself whichever that may be at the time alongside this we provide an industry analysis this is a document and accompanying video which help you give that contextual information in your exam so for example if the pre scenes on the oil industry, the industry analysis will break down the oil industry, the current topics, trends, issues, what the competitive market looks like, all those kind of aspects, all condensed into one so you can spend your time wisely in your study period. Following on from this, when you actually want to practice all this knowledge, we have mock exams for all of our materials. So StudyTex has a generic mock exam based on the module whereas the pre-scene analysis has mocks available to purchase that are based on that specific pre-scene that are targeted to the key issues we believe will come up. And if you're not content with just doing those mock exams and practicing that way, we have a marking and feedback system where you can purchase the ability to send in your paper, have it marked by a SEMA qualified accountant and get personalized feedback by on whether you can improve X or Y area. And sort of finally, if you will, if you're feeling really unprepared and that exam is coming really, really soon, the master classes are offered by Astranti and they're essentially a crash course in anything you could want for that topic. So if it's a master class on the pre scene, it's going to give you absolutely everything that you could possibly need to know about the pre scene in one in one rather really condensed sitting. Likewise, if it was the F3 masterclass, you would have all of F3 gone through in a very crash course style presentation and video link. You can also purchase it post stream as opposed to viewing it live, all these kind of aspects. We are very, very confident that these materials will help you get the exam success that you want. So we have a pass guarantee. Provided you fill out a form which demonstrates that you have utilized our materials to a large extent, and actually taken the time to study them, and you have unfortunately failed, 
we will offer you the same materials again for the next sitting as in a consolidatory offer to ensure that you can get back on the horse and get that exam grade that you want. With that said, thank you very much for watching the sample video. I hope you enjoyed it and it gives you a lot of confidence in Estranti and your SEMA future.